Exactly. <laughs> Howdy, and welcome to Brose. Just a couple of bros drinking rose and talking fitness. I'm your host, Mike Garrity, the strongest comedian to ever come out of Reno. And I'm here with my co-host, Dustin Nelson. He's a doctor of Chinese medicine, a kinesiologist, an acupuncturist, an herbalist, uh, and uh, he he's a hot. <laughs> We're here to help you sift through all the BS and the self-care and the fitness uh, industry and, and point you towards the right direction. And we always start that out by doing a quick lightning round, hot five overview of the questions we are gonna be talking about today. Okay. So just in case you want some quick answers, you can digest this and get on out of here. And then afterwards we do a deeper dive for those of you that want to increase your intellect. Oh, dive deep, get smart. Dive deep, get smart. Another great <laughs> idea for a t-shirt. Yeah. Lots of merch. Okay, here we go, Dustin. <laughs> Hot five, answer these as quickly as possible. Okay. Ready? Yeah. One, are there any strands of kratom that can be leveraged for health? Yes. Okay. Can I turbocharge liver detox after a debaucherous weekend? No. Mmm, that sucks. Is Carrot <laughs> Top funnier than Jeff Dunham? I don't know who Jeff Dunham is, so I'm gonna say, I, yeah. The answer is yes, okay. good, 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 good. <laughs> uh, do blue light blocking glasses work? Uh, that depends. That's a, that's a, man, that's a tough question. I don't, well, it's good to block blue light with glasses. Not all of them work. Okay. Next question. Do we even need to block blue light? Not a bad idea. All right. Does pickling veggies lower their nutrient density? Yes. Yes. <whistles> What's it mean if my body odor completely changes flavor out of nowhere? <laughs> I, I have I have follow up questions there. Um, it can mean a lot of things. We'll just we'll dive into that. It, it can mean you're on a medication. It can mean bacterial change. It can mean food change. There's a lot of things. All right. that, but smelling is an underrated diagnostic tool in medicine. Yeah, yeah. The, Not so, tasting. Uh, I can use. A, I have a dog that can tell me uh, who's who's lying and who's telling the truth just by smelling. Have a service dog? Huh. No, it's just a, a, a dog that I made up when I couldn't think of a good joke. <laughs> All right, let's dive into these a little deeper. Okay. So, Dustin, are there any strands of Kratom that can be leveraged for health? Yeah, it's not, I, okay. So you asked that question about the strands and yes, there's varietal. So with any plant-based medicine, there are- Can you tell me what Kratom is, first of all? Yeah, it's honestly, an opioid. I don't it's know a what it's a, it's an opioid, it's a plant. Like it's, marijuana? Uh, yeah, like heroin, like fentanyl. It's, oh. yeah, no, it's it's a big it's a big hitter. So better. <laughs> that, well, part of the reason that it's become more prevalent and uh, popular is because of the effects. It's plant-based, and so there's, I think the, the naturalists say, hey, it's plant-based and that's great, so we wanna lean into it. It is a natural painkiller. It is an opioid, and it is, uh, fairly effective. Um, that's not the issue. Uh, the issue that people have with it, this is not strain dependent, is the fact that it is also addictive and it also has a diminishing return, which means you know, the more we take it, the less mm, effective it's Chasing gonna be. that dragon. Yeah. So the problem becomes then if we get ourselves into a spot where we're like, hey, this is great, we're taking it. Are we dealing with the root of the issue or the branch of the issue? And if it's a pain issue, that solution is not going to get us to the root cause. That's going to be a, a palliative branch treatment, meaning it's going to knock the pain out and help you live your life better, but it's not going to fix that root cause. What about the Kratom that's like, people are like, I'll take this and it helps me focus, or I'll take this and it's a good pre-workout. Yeah, I mean, again, these it, that we have, is juice worth squeeze? And the issue that we have within this is the concern that you're going to be more addictive and it will reduce its efficacy. So if something, look, Mo, there's a lot of things that have, uh, th look, this is really important with everything with health and fitness, okay? We, we adapt, we're trying to force adaptation. That's what we do when we train. We force adaptations. This is why it's so important to change our exercises, okay? Because we adapt to it and it becomes less effective. You do the same bicep curl every day for 30 days, the, the bicep curl you did on day 30 is less effective than the bicep curl you did yeah, on day bicep one. Bicep curls don't get you high. True. True. Yeah. Unless you're, yeah. But so because 
it's less effective. We have to rotate. Now, what happens if you're so addicted to that curl that you just, you've got that compulsion. You just can't switch to another item. See, therein lies the issue because now it becomes detrimental. Now it's actually costing you progress. And that's what we see with any of the opioid issues, which is why the, uh, the uh, governing bodies tried to make it illegal. I don't think they were effective yet. Uh, and that's okay. I'm not judging that either way. All I'm saying is that there, if we're looking for a painkiller, there are less addictive uh, and perhaps uh, better ways to do that than simply going after the crowd. If they make Kratom illegal, that's going to cause a lot of uh, crime and war at these fish concerts. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, also a problem. All right. Too. So yeah, uh, Kratom... Right. Take it. Hey, look, take it if you want to. I don't have a problem with, with people, you know, using well, things if they want it. to, but it's, it, and it will be a painkiller and it can be uh, useful in a lot of, uh, uh, there, there are uses to it. But the biggest concern you have is it's an opioid that can be addictive and it diminishes its return. So perhaps you want to move it, move a different direction. Yeah, folks, it's think of it like the, the ring from Lord of the Rings. It'll make yeah. you invisible, uh, but then you have a hard time not being invisible. Yeah. And that's not good for anyone except perverts. Next question. Can I turbocharge liver detox after a debaucherous weekend? Yeah, I think I said no to you that. You did say no. Yeah. Well, here's why. Because the the, the, the big fat loss burner things that were yeah. really popular in like the 90s and early 2000s. Well, and then there's this metabolic, it's like it speeds up your metabolic rate. And it's like, well, that's a 12 step process. Okay. That if you speed up one section, you're not necessarily doing that all the way through. So what we end up seeing with detoxification is through the liver, there's three phases, okay? And so as long as those are operating optimally, and the good news for human beings is we don't really have to be actively engaged in that, our body does it for us, uh, you're not really gonna speed that up. Now what you can you juice do, it up? No, not really. You can support it and help it be normal and optimal, but you just do that by supporting with your, your phase one, and phase two detoxifier nutrients and all those things, which, is just something you should do in your normal health and fitness routine, which is this, you take antioxidants. Okay, what do you think of when you think of a detox? Teas and juices and all these things, they're mostly antioxidants. And that's mostly what we see in phase one detoxification. It's kind of like your body pre-sorting and getting ready to get rid of toxins, okay? Right. That's not where people have issues. Where people have issues is in phase two, where there's six pathways and there's a couple of nutrients that people tend to be deficient in. Okay, so there's a process of methylation and then there's the need for glutathione. Glutathione and what's the other one? Methylation, so it'd be methyl. methyl that doesn't sound like a nutrient, it sounds like a process. It, methylation is a process that requires methylated B vitamins. Okay. Okay, so if you put methylated B vitamins with antioxidants and glutathione, which is the master antioxidant, you're gonna really help people do phase one and phase, phase two detoxification. And then phase three is sweating and pooping and you know, respirating pee -pee. and all those things. Pee -pee. So, all right. So that's what you, that's what you can do though. If you want to put nutrients on board, get a bunch of veggies, support with those supplements, and then go and force a bunch of water through your skin by drinking a lot of water and going and sweating and sitting in a sauna, then that will make you feel better potentially, but it's not going to all of a sudden just double your detox. It's just okay. going to help you out. It's going to make your detox go back to normal. Yeah. What's the, the Chinese herb they can take for helping with detox? With glutathione? Yeah. Uh, probably uh, chai hoop plurium. Chai hoop plurium. Yeah, because a lot of people don't, a lot of people, if you go out and buy glutathione, whether it's an S acetyl or a liposomal or whatever that is, they can't, there's a, there's a percentage of the population that will not absorb that. Right. So one of the herbs you can use to help with that is uh, chai hoop plurium. Chai hoop plurium, spell that. B -E -P. No time. Next question. Do you blue light blocking glasses work? Some of them do. Can you really spell blue plurium? I yeah, I used to actually have to spell it and say it in three languages. It's part of school, but this ain't school. All so right, blue light either. glasses, uh, blue light blocking glasses. Yeah, so some of them work. Some of them, I'm sure there's counterfeit blue lights. I mean, I'm sure. Right. I'm sure. Look, well, how do you pick out a pair that works? Is probably a better I question. Don't know. Like, there's ones that are more expensive. <laughs> I don't. Know. No, I, there's there's a wide variety of these, but let's talk. Okay, let's talk about blue light. Blue light, biggest threats that we have from blue light are going to be that it can disrupt your sleep. Okay. Why? Well, some research suggests that it can actually ramp down your melatonin production. 
that's potentially bad for sleep. I heard it tricks your brain into thinking it's morning time to right. wake up. That can't, well, and also you don't, your body produces these things and releases these things at different times in the day. Okay, so you don't take melatonin in the morning, right? Although there are people who microdose it for different reasons, but I don't, what I would say is, it, is that the, it can reduce your melatonin production. It can also create uh, eye damage. The constant exposure to those types of screens and things that we're trying to block can damage the eye. And as we age, we already have issues with maintaining the integrity of the retina and helping us with our ability to see. So long-term exposure to these things can drop our melatonin and they make it uh, disrupt our sleep, make you think it's day, um, reduce the quality of your sleep, which can do all kinds of things downstream of like, you know, increasing your oxidative rate and aging you faster, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Reducing your energy production. Wait, is this what blue blockers do? Remember those? I do. Pol yeah, no, those help you like see the fish. Oh, they were different. They were polarized? They were polarized and they, right. they were on the sides, but the blue light can damage the eye and reduce the melatonin. And so it's not a bad idea to limit that, but not all of the glasses you see are going to help you do it. And you know, if you're only wearing them for an hour a night or so, or you don't wear them, then they're not going to be overly so effective. You, but you don't know like which ones work or a brand or how to get ones that work. Yeah. I wouldn't really feel confident saying, I know this one brand works. All right. So but what I would you. say, Mike, is this, your phone should have a setting where it can go into night mode. That'll help you reduce it. If you just reduce your screen time in the evening, that'll help. If you're having troubles falling asleep at night, you know, try to fix the gut where your serotonin is made and then your melatonin converts from serotonin or maybe take a melatonin supplement. And let's approach it that way before we just reach for some like Warby Parker, $200 a pair blue blocker glasses. Yeah, but you heard them earlier say that they kind of work. So you could just do that. They do. Yeah. I'm not gonna say they don't work, they do. But I, I, would, I would explore the options of reducing my screen time and improving well, my sleep quality before I went to I'm going to explore the options of getting some blue light blocking glasses so I can watch the animated series Gargoyles on my phone in bed every night so I have good dreams. Next question. Does pickling veggies lower their nutrient density? Yeah. I mean, this is kind of just a yes or no question, yeah. right? We don't need to dive uh, into that. Well, I mean, is it true that vinegar takes more nutrients out of it than just a salt brine? You know, um, I don't know. I've heard that. I don't know that that's true. The reason that the reason that we know or think we know that pickling will do it is because the water soluble vitamins get degraded. So you got to drink that juice. Yeah. So that's yeah, that's that doesn't mean there's not any nutrients in there. And that doesn't mean that there's not other benefits to it. But do you remember that Christian Bale movie where he takes a turkey baster and tapes a syringe to the end of it and then squirts a bunch of pickle juice up his urethra so that he could pass a drug test? What? Pretty simple question. <laughs> do you remember that? I do. Okay. Well, it didn't work. Mike, when next we, question. When we go back, well, this, do you have a note for me? I do have a note for you, which is just, I feel compelled to tell you that you should, there's never an okay situation for you to, for you personally to stick anything in your urethra. Well, you haven't heard all my ideas yet. Next question is, what's it mean if my body odor completely changes flavor out of nowhere? <laughs> uh, there was one day in my life when I was in high school where I smelled like Parmesan cheese. <laughs> and it was just pungent. One. Yeah, nothing, nothing before or uh, after. Okay, first and foremost, smelling is an underrated evaluation and diagnostic in, in medicine. This is something we do in, in Eastern medicine. There's the look and touch the pits. Not the pits per se, but yeah, you definitely um, you, what do you, you use the olfactory what do you sense. Well, because what you're smelling for, and one of the what reasons- What body parts do you smell? When it's the not the parts, medicine? Mike. It's, oh. it's, it's, it's more about trying to evaluate the whole person. So for example, if you happen to notice some changes that move in a direction of being more sweet or uh, more bread-like. This could be a sign of- We're talking body of, odor? Correct. Okay. It could be more o overgrowth of bacteria. It could be blood sugars that have changed. Right? Where's the where would the bacteria be if, if it's coming out? It's a good odor? question. There, it can be anywhere and okay. it could be external or it could be internal, but sometimes those smells will emanate. Even if you can't see it, you can smell that it's there. So whether that's bacterial overgrowth or if there's fungus- and that's like a bread smell? There, yeah. You know, so like the smell of a mushroom, right? Those things okay. are kind of gross. But the- uh, but yeah, you can you can absolutely use smell changes for things that are going on as underlying conditions uh, for 
changes to things like your blood chemistry, uh, to your detoxification ability. Yeah, what are the other flavors? What are the other flavors, man? Uh, sour, there's sour, there's acrid, there's um, uh, like uh, yeasty, those types of things. So, uh, okay. Amine, which is kind of like that vinegar, uh, like, right. uh, you know, type smell. There's, so, and they all can indicate different things that we try to use and triangulate in evaluation. But the thing that you want to look at is here is say, is my detoxification changing through my liver, my kidneys? Do I have an underlying condition or something like diabetes? Am I, um, and have I changed my diet? And also hormonal changes can have an effect on this too. You can see changes with uh, mothers, for example, when they're pregnant and their, their body um, or changes. And often this could be an evolutionary thing or it could be a change for the hormones. Uh, and then you said something about medication too, right? Medications can change it as well, absolutely. Mm, can you smell if I'm upset with you? <laughs> uh, Maybe not you specifically. Yeah, I'm not. I'm. I haven't trained my. What sniffer if I get a hormone way. release when I'm when I'm annoyed? Oh, well, I would tell that. Yeah, that's your pupils would tell me that. All right, folks. The, uh, basically, the bottom line is if your uh, if your body odor change flavors, you got to look at your bacteria, your liver detox. Uh, what kind of medicines are you taking? Did you change your diet, or are you pregnant, or were you pregnant and now you're not? Oh. Did I miss anything? Maybe oh yeah, Dustin sniffs little. armpits I for don't. a living. You admitted that. And that brings us to our next portion of the show, which is uh, where I tell you two truths and a lie yeah. about myself, which okay. is literally just uh, my extremely extravagant way to get free health advice. <laughs> okay. okay, and you tell me which one the lie is, all right? Okay. Here we go, the number lie. one. Even though I can coach deadlifts and Romanian deadlifts, I can't seem to do them without getting a sore back. Two, I have no idea what my body is doing unless I can see it in a mirror as I'm moving. Uh, and number three, I get lower back pain every time I do barbell back squats. I'm gonna go with the lie being, you have no idea what your body's doing unless you see it in the mirror. Well, am I wrong? Well, here's, Here's why this is hard for you, because they're uh, number two and number three are both half true and half, <laughs> okay. half lie, because I feel like I'm doing everything right. And I feel my body and I'm usually very good at feeling my body, yeah. yet I get the back pain. So I've got to be doing something okay. wrong. So, and then the squat thing, you know, sometimes. Okay. I so a couple of things here. One, it's not uncommon for have people to be, uh, this is going to be so judgy, to be a motor moron where we try to get you to do something. Well, it's not judgy if you say it differently. Yeah, it's it's not it's not a judgment. It's just that they're, the the body, you hear it and you wanna do it, but your body won't do it. Mm -hmm. And that's not uncommon for people. Um, as we train- Like we, un being uncoordinated? Yeah, in a way. And oftentimes your coordination is really ingrained in you by the time you hit puberty, right? So a lot of times you'll see people who train later in life and they're like, I don't know how to move. And it's like, well, yeah, you didn't really train yourself as a kid, yeah, which, is one of the which is one of the, da the dangers we have with kids being so sedentary is you're, you're kind of setting yourself up for a life oh. of you know, difficulty this way. Okay, so here's the deal with this, is that what it tells me is that there's something in the pelvo uh, lumbo rhythm, the pelvis and the, and the lumbar rhythm with your squat patterning that or deadlift patterning that is probably um, in need of correction and alteration could be the angle of your feet. It could be the width of your uh, foot and your hip, because there's probably some things going on in your hip. Then it's forcing that tension and pain into your lower back. And it's not so much that you can't change that. You just need somebody who's not you to look at it and make those corrections. So I'll have a look at it for you. But in, in general, if something hurts, you're doing it wrong. Yeah. You ask somebody because there's chances are we're not doing it right. And right. that's, and, and there's never, it's not, unless you get somebody who's a qualified professional saying, no, you're fine. P push through the discomfort. Discomfort's different than pain. So unless you get a professional who says, Hey, push through discomfort, you're safe here. Then, which is an important deal. Cause some people just don't train. Then I would say this, if it hurts, stop don't do that and then ask for help because we just got to get that that rhythm figured out but well here's what i think hurt. i need i think my body grew too fast for my brain so i need another smaller brain in my ass like no. a brontosaurus no. No. no no well let's google it and that's brose folks thank you so much for joining us today i have been mike g i'm here with dr d and don't forget to get your bros spayed and neutered i do want to look at your squat 
Thank you. <laughs>